After a series of successful campaigns from 1000 to 1004, Emperor Basil began specifically focusing his war aims against Bulgaria itself. Although far from having lost his ability to fight, Samuel was no longer seen by many as a serious threat to the Balkan themes of the empire. His raiding expeditions had effectively been reduced to the city of Thessaloniki and the immediate area. Although his men had managed to ambush and capture the region's governor, Ioan Kaldus, this small success was outweighed by the setbacks and losses the Bulgarians had suffered over the past four years. On top of this, many of Samuel's governors were beginning to foresee the future direction and course of the conflict with Byzantium, a future that did not favor the Bulgarian cause. Bulgarian noblemen were enticed by the prospect of switching allegiances to Constantinople, even Samuel's own kinsmen. Around the year 1005, Basil received a visit from the Tsar's son-in-law, Asot Taranites. The son of one of Basil's former governors, Gregory Taranites, Asot had been captured by Samuel in 995 during a skirmish outside the walls of Thessaloniki. After spending almost a year in prison, he was finally freed and married Samuel's daughter, Miroslava, before being sent by the Tsar to govern the coastal city of Dyrrhachium. By 1005, however, Taranites and the patriarch of the city's leading family, a man who just so happened to be Samuel's father-in-law, Yanis Kriselios, decided to surrender the city to Basil. The gates were open to the emperor's men, allowing for Basil to occupy the city without shedding a drop of blood. With this great bloodless coup, the emperor had managed to re-establish control over one of the major Adriatic ports in the Balkans. Sensing weakness, Basil made preparations to bring the full weight of the Byzantine Empire on Samuel of Bulgaria. A brave warrior and blade were a potent weapon in centuries past, but today this intrepid lady has become one with the blade as well, wielding Japanese steel kitchen knives made by Kamakoto, the sponsor of today's video. Kamakoto makes Japanese steel knives using traditional techniques from Japan. Building on over 800 years of Japanese technology and expertise dating back to the Edo period, each blade is meticulously handcrafted. Kamakoto's expert bladesmiths have over 100 years of experience between them, and while creating each blade, they go through a 19-step process that takes several years to complete. Their product range features a vast array of Japanese steel knives, such as the three-piece Kanpeki knife set that comes with a 7-inch vegetable knife, the 8.5-inch slicing knife, and the 5-inch utility knife. Each knife has a single bevel blade, making it extremely sharp and excellent for fine cutting. The satin finish handle provides a nice weight and balance and feels comfortable in the hand. Kamakoto's Japanese steel knives are highly rated by professional chefs working in Michelin star restaurants around the world. Each knife comes in a beautiful heavy duty ash wood box, making them an excellent gift and ensures the knives are stored safely. Kamakoto is running a massive sale right now and is offering my viewers an extra $50 off on any purchase with the discount code HISTORYMARSH. Using the link below helps my channel, so if you're looking for quality kitchen knives or wish to gift someone a set of Japanese steel knives, go to kamakoto.com slash historymarsh to get a huge discount. Between 1005 and 1014, the Roman-Bulgarian conflict de-escalated into a series of low-intensity raids and petty campaigns, with few pitched battles taking place. Samuel continued his raids into the suburbs of Thessaloniki, plundering gold and resources. Basil would respond with short, fast-moving, punitive expeditions into the southern frontier borders of Bulgaria. It is highly likely that during this nine-year time span, Basil managed to essentially outsource the conflict with Bulgaria to his Balkan governors, most notably to the Duke of Philippopolis, Nikiforos Xiphias, and the newly titled Duke of Thessaloniki, Theophylact Botaniates, grandfather to a future emperor. 
Despite his shifted focus on domestic affairs, the Emperor still did not miss out on opportunities to personally involve himself in campaigns against the Bulgarians. In 1009, he managed to inflict a minor defeat on Samuel at the Battle of Krita, several miles to the east of Thessaloniki. Following this clash, the conflict resumed its trend of low-intensity warfare, as Basil's attention shifted elsewhere within the Empire. Located on the southernmost tip of the Italian peninsula, the last possessions of the Roman Empire in its ancient homeland had been subjected to Muslim piracy by the late 10th century. These sporadic raids became more frequent and devastating during the 990s, when Basil was preoccupied dealing with enemies on the major frontiers of the empire. Despite this, a mix of clever diplomacy and the arrival of fresh reinforcements in the early 1000s allowed the emperor to preserve his Italian provinces. The Byzantine governors, or catapans of Italy, managed to safeguard many of their cities from Muslim sacking by appealing to the rising Italian republics of Pisa and Venice. In one such instance, the very seat of the Byzantine catapan, the Apulian town of Bari, was saved from certain sacking after a squadron of Venetian galleys destroyed the Muslim fleet at the city's harbor. Beginning in the early 1000s, the emperor began diverting more of his attention and manpower toward Italy. He increased the size of local garrisons and sent emissaries bringing lavish gifts to the court of the Kalbid Emirate of Sicily, Jafar al-Kalbi. As a result, the number of Muslim raids in Byzantine Italy gradually declined during the first decade of the 11th century. Despite this, Basil would soon be forced to deal with another great nuisance on the peninsula. In 1009, a Lombard nobleman from Bari named Melus managed to seize the town in an attempt to carve out a state of his own in Byzantine Apulia. Yet the Lombard baron's plans were laid to waste as the emperor's newly appointed catapan, Basil Mesardenites, began a siege of the city. After eventually being forced out by the local Greeks in 1011, Melus was forced to seek refuge in Salerno, and so Bari fell back into Byzantine hands. With Italy stabilized, Emperor Basil began preparations for a final showdown with his old rival, Samuel of Bulgaria. In the early summer of 1014, Basil set out from Constantinople and marched toward Macedonia with an army close to around 30,000 men. In the beginning of his advance, however, the emperor was only accompanied by 10,000 men from the regular Tagmata forces of Constantinople. During the march, the Byzantine ranks swelled when troops from the Balkan themes linked up with the emperor along the road to Macedonia. This included men under the leadership of the famed Duke of Philippopolis, Nikiforos Xiphias. He was to play an important role in the upcoming campaign. In the meantime, Theophylact and his several thousand strong garrison were ordered to remain in Thessalonica to guard the oft-targeted city against a potential Bulgarian counter-offensive. Samuel wasted little time in making his own preparations for meeting Basil's army. The Tsar and his son, Gavriel Radomar, set out for the mountains of eastern Macedonia. There they began blocking the mountain passes and valleys leading into Macedonia with wooden ramparts, or demos as they were known to the Bulgarians. Samuel made the sturdy fortress of Strumitsa his base of operation. This strategic fort was located in a narrow valley between the mountains of Belazitsa to the south and Grazitstan in the north. The Tsar and his men blocked a narrow area in the passage close to the western edge of the valley, several miles away from a village called Kledion. It was a route frequently utilized by the Bulgarian armies while on campaign. Furthermore, the Tsar's men had constructed ramparts, blocking any other passages that Basil could use to outflank Samuel, especially around the valley of the nearby Varda River. Overall, Samuel's army numbered around 10,000 men, dispersed around the mountains to garrison the many wooden palisades. The long, tall rampart close to Kledion 
was guarded by the largest number of men, probably around 2,000. The Tsar, his son, and the bulk of his army were likely concentrated around Strumitsa. Samuel's strategy was to wait for Basil to march his men down one of the blocked passages. Once this was done, the wall garrisons would be large enough to hold the Romans long enough for the Tsar to muster his men from the other palisades and quickly march to reinforce the besieged wall. Yet there was one hitch to Samuel's plan, the Roman garrison at Thessalonica. Theophylact could choose to march his men at any moment using an alternative pass. Thus, if Samuel was to concentrate all of his forces around a single palisade, he would risk being flanked in the rear by Theophylact's forces. And so, the Tsar sent a contingent of cavalry led by General David Nestoritzes to harass the Duke. Unfortunately for the Bulgarians, Theophylact had learned of the approaching horse contingent and successfully intercepted in the Third Battle of Thessalonica. The small Bulgarian force was annihilated together with its commander, David. Worse still for Samuel, after this victory the Duke of Thessalonica and his several thousand strong army immediately marched for Bulgaria. Meanwhile, Basil and the main Byzantine army had already managed to march through Mosinopolis, Ceres, and the Rupel Pass, and were now heading towards the Cledion Rampart. Samuel had correctly predicted that the Emperor would use this route, and so he had left his largest garrison division there. Yet upon receiving the news of David's defeat in the south, the Tsar and his son quickly realized that they, together with the bulk of their army, were effectively trapped in Strumitsa. The town of Cledion was too far away from the passes that Theophylact could potentially march through with his men. If Samuel was to reinforce the defending garrison at Cledion, he would do so at the risk of being completely surrounded, cut off from any avenue of escape. By mid-July, Basil had encamped his men close to the large Cledion rampart. Almost as soon as he arrived, the Emperor organized a large assault force and attempted to storm the sturdy wooden palisade. As the Byzantines approached the wall, they were showered with arrows and stones launched by the Bulgarian defenders on the ramparts. Despite their valiant efforts, the Romans failed to climb over or destroy the strong fortification. The Bulgarian defenders, veterans of dozens of campaigns, would put up a dogged resistance against the Byzantines. With Roman casualties climbing rapidly, Basil called off his assault on the wall. Throughout the coming days, the Emperor would launch a series of unsuccessful attacks to try and capture the palisade. By late July, morale was plummeting in the Byzantine camp. Theophylact and his reinforcements were nowhere within sight. Supplies were diminishing fast, and it was feared that Samuel could appear at any moment with the bulk of his army. Basil began to seriously consider retreating. Yet his trusted general Xiphias persuaded the emperor to stay and fight. The Duke of Philippopolis and the emperor knew that it was impossible for the Bulgarians to block every single small and forested road through the mountains, and so Basil sent Nikiforos and several cavalry contingents out of the camp to locate an alternative route that would hopefully lead them into the valley and straight into the rear of the Bulgarian army. On the morning of the 29th of July 1014, Basil arranged his troops in assault parties readying himself to storm the palisade one more time. However, before he could even order the advance to commence, the Emperor noticed some type of commotion unfolding behind the enemy lines. The sound of a thousand galloping hooves smashing into the ground soon filled the air. The Bulgarian defenders overlooking Basil's men turned their heads in the opposite direction only to spot Xiphias and his cavalry troopers charging straight at their rear. Panic set in amongst the Bulgarians' ranks. 
the entire defense force on the wall left their positions to confront the charging horsemen. As the Bulgarians smashed into Zephias's galloping troopers, Basil realized his plan had worked to perfection. His men stormed the ramparts and destroyed the now abandoned palisade, then charged straight at the stunned defenders. As they were about to become pinned between Zephias's cavalry and Basil's footmen, many of the Bulgarians fled in the direction of Strumitsa. Those unable to do so were either hacked down where they stood or captured by the Romans. Desiring to exploit the situation, the emperor ordered a pursuit. As the Byzantine forces approached the village of Markievo, they were suddenly met by Samuel and Gavrail's army, which had sallied forth from Strumitsa. Basil and Xiphias reacted quickly upon seeing the reinforced and charging Bulgarian army. They immediately ordered a halt to the pursuit and regrouped their lines. Samuel's charge was successfully blunted by the Romans, and a vicious bloody melee clash ensued. Fighting his way across the front lines and refusing to surrender, the 70-year-old Samuel quickly became trapped in the melee. Realizing his forces were slowly melting away, Gavriel Radomar managed to cut his way through to his father, mount him on his horse, and retreat to Strumitsa with most of his men. Opting to avoid moving too far into enemy territory, Basil called off the pursuit, bringing an end to the battle. Although a clear-cut Byzantine victory, the Battle of Cledion resulted in minimal immediate gains for Byzantium. Yet Samuel had lost many good men at the battle, including nearly 2,000 Bulgarians captured, now at the mercy of the Byzantine Emperor. After the victory, Basil secured some of the region's local fortresses and marched on to Stromitsa. In the meantime, Gavriel was able to send his father away to the safety of Prilep. The heir to the Bulgarian throne then moved from Strumitsa into the Varda River Valley, collecting the defenders of the remaining palisades and preparing to take the fight into the mountains. Now reinforced by the recently arrived army of Tiafalact, Basil and Xiphias marched on Samuel's former base of operations. The Byzantines attempted to lay siege to Strumitsa, but failed to make any progress for weeks. Basil decided to send Tiafalact to clear a path of retreat towards Thessalonica. Soon after, the Duke entered the Varda River Valley, destroying the local wooden palisades without any resistance. As the Byzantine regiment approached ever closer to Thessalonica, they reached a narrow defile of land between the mountains of Blazitsa and Plaus. Just as he began to think of withdrawing back to Basil's main army, Theophylact and his men spotted suspicious movement on the mountain slopes. Before they realized what was happening, the Byzantine troops were showered with arrows, stones, and other projectiles from all directions they had fallen prey to a Bulgarian ambush. As panic set in amongst the Byzantine ranks and hundreds fell from arrow volleys, the ambushers emerged from the slopes and revealed themselves. They were Gavrail's men. The Bulgarians swiftly surrounded the shocked Romans on all sides and slaughtered Tiafalact's entire force, including the Duke himself. Furious upon receiving the news of the ambush and the Duke's death, Basil set out to avenge the fallen general and his men. The Emperor had captured over a thousand of Samuel's men in the Battle of Cledion. Now they were to pay the price for their Tsar's insubordination. In what was seen even at the time as a ruthless punishment, Basil had every 99 of a hundred Bulgarian soldiers blinded leaving every a hundredth man with one eye, to lead his sightless comrades back to their Tsar. The exact number of men blinded or whether or not this cruel punishment even occurred remains uncertain, as it is first mentioned in stories after the Emperor's reign. Whatever the case, it was this act that would earn Basil II his immortal nickname, 
the Balga Slayer. If you stayed around this far, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment as a sacrifice to the algorithm. You can also support us on Patreon and get ad-free early access to our videos for as little as $1 or by clicking the thanks button below to leave a one-time tip. As always, we'll see you in the next one.